welcome to the Pod of Inquiry, pushing the envelope for human understanding and optimization, the podcast for podiatrists. The Pod of Inquiry is designed to empower you with knowledge. What happens from there is up to you. Your host, Dr. Stephen Barrett, has designed this show to take you down some very deep rabbit holes, hopefully bringing you back out again, relatively unscathed, but cerebrally whipped, enabling a better understanding of all things worthy of inquiry. If you have more questions after the show, then that is good. The new discovery today many times was the new discovery 50 years ago, only to be suppressed or plainly ignored. Medicine and surgery can sometimes take a long while to get their paradigm shifted. We hope to have a lot of fun on this show and maybe destroy some ridiculous dogma along the journey. Thanks for joining the show today. Let's start spelunking. All right, everyone. I want to welcome you back to my discussion with Dr. Phil Gotcha. Last week, we started off talking about Ozempic and all things nutrition, and we're going to continue that discussion uh, today because he had so much to say. I had to just divide this into two episodes. Uh, so please enjoy my follow-up and continuation of my discussion with Dr. Phil Gotcha. That's a very, oh, not only does it make sense, but that's a very important point. And, you know, we're not trying to prescribe any type of treatment on this show, but that yeah. might be somebody that, you know, something that somebody thinks about it that's having maybe more side effects than they would like to have while they're, they're under this uh, uh, treatment. Uh, and that would be, you know, just to, to manage these um, toxins. And, uh, yeah. you know, so it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So, and, and, when when we did the lecture, you were kind enough to invite me to. Um, I remember asking the crowd, "Hey, do, who 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 believes in like detoxing?" And I'm sure it was conjured up in people's minds where like the '60s and '70s and hippies doing weirdo fasts and like waving a dead chicken over their head and like, "Okay, now I'm detoxed and this crystal helped clean me out." No, look, if you go to the bathroom, you're detoxing, and there's certain uh, nutrients and hormones and enzymes that are part of that process, and if you have them your body works efficiently. And if you don't, the body will struggle in some form or fashion. That's a great thing for people to reach out. That should be, that should be a podcast we do on how the body gets rid of waste from, from oh, the time yeah. it's, it enters the cells to the time you hit the toilet and get rid of that junk. And how do you make sure it runs efficiently? That would be a beautiful one. Can I ask you something? The doctor that came to me and said, Hey, again, this whole thing started. This wonderful friend said, I want to put my dad on this stuff. They say there's no contraindications. They say that that there are no labs required. The doctor said, hey, what labs would you run? Study the drug, come back to me. What labs would you would you run? And here's the data. So I want to give you what tests I would run and why. Okay. And it's going to kind of inform us on some of the some of the issues that can come up. So the first thing I ran, cheap tests, by the way, very inexpensive. I ran a CBC uh, on, on on this on this doctor's father. And I wanted to rule out anemia. Um why? Because if you're taking an appetite suppressant or something that slows down gut, right, right. you're not going to absorb nutrients. So if you have an anemia and we're talking uh, iron, we're talking B vitamins, we're talking folate, well, then you're going to stress the body. Next one, CMP. Uh, this is a test that rules out kidney or liver disease. Um, these drugs should not be administered if your kidney function is under 15. And for those who are initiated, that means you're in kidney failure and no kidding, you got bigger problems. Um, next uh, we want to check insulin. Why? If the person is diabetic, if the person is pre-diabetic, we're going to re want to repeat these labs frequently um, throughout their use of semaglutides or post-semaglutide, and make sure that 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 we're that we're handling that blood sugar situation properly, and that medications are being being managed properly by the prescriber. Next, um, an insulin and hemoglobin A1C. Those are the ones I'd read for that. Next, I would check lipase and amylase. Why? Lipase and amylase, we think gallbladder. We think, can you process fats? And so if we're dealing with issues with the gallbladder and this helps break down fat, we want to be we want to be on the ball with that. Additional labs, we always want to look at the thyroid. People's metabolism can be messed up because the thyroid isn't working right. And when we screen for thyroid dysfunction, there's multiple mechanisms, but we also then look, the thyroid gives us a lot of information on stress. Did you know when you're stressed, that same hypothalamus, 
that picks up feedback from the entire body. How much physical, chemical, or emotional stress is this human being under? That thalamus communicates with the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland then tells your thyroid to speed up or slow down. So many of the folks we see coming into the office, they have slow thyroids. Therefore, they have the symptoms of, slow, of, of low thyroid. They're cold hands, they're cold feet, their body temperature's off, their hair is brittle, their skin isn't being replaced and repaired properly, their nails are no good, um, they're sluggish of brain, sluggish of body, and they gain weight. And they're saying, hey, I want to go take a drug to manipulate my physiology. Well, your thyroid isn't working. Okay, good. Do I need an endocrinologist? Maybe. Or wait a second, there's some lab values that show this is actually a stress response. Holy cow. You need to go upstream to the cause. What's happening physically, chemically, and even mentally and emotionally that's got your physiology twitterpated, right? So the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and the thyroid axis is thrown off. That gets missed. Then I would look at uric acid. I want to see if the person has metabolic dysfunction. I check vitamin D, vitamin B12. I check folate. Um, I check magnesium. Why? Because if there's nutritional deficiencies, it's going to aggravate. You're going to aggravate a deficiency with a suppressant. I'd look at cortisol. Um, if cortisol levels are off, then this is an endocrinologist problem, not a not a synthetic GLP-1 problem. Then I look at stool testing. You beautiful guy brought this up earlier. If you slow down motility through the gut, you're going to decrease what's called peristalsis. So how long does it take for things to move from hooter to tutor? Well, when that happens, um, you're going to aggravate a dysbiosis. So dysbiosis is an imbalance between the friendly and opportunistic critters in the gut. Well, if things are moving through nicely, the body's used to the weight garbage in, garbage out, and we're good. But if the garbage kind of hangs out for a while, right? well, then the bacteria doesn't like it. Next, I would look at yeast overgrowth in the gut. Why? If you have a yeast overgrowth in the gut, you're going to get terrible cravings, especially when you need, when you use this med, because the yeast wants to live, and it lives on sugar, and you're taking something that stops you from being hungry. Well, that yeast is going to send near death signals to your brain as it dies. It's trying to make you feel awful. So you give in and start consuming sugar. Um, and then SIBO, small intestine bacterial overgrowth. You hear about those people. Yeah. What's with those people? They've got between their large intestine and small intestine, they have an invasion. You have friendly critters in the gut and you have a really rough band of biker prison yard outlaws that live in your large <laughs> intestine, right? So, 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 so these are the critters that if you go to the bathroom and the bacteria from the large intestine gets on your hands and you touch somebody's food, you could kill them. Yet at the same time, in that same digestive tract where those bad guys are, just north of those bad guys, you have a bacteria that's so friendly. When you have a healthy person, you could take bacteria, do a fecal transplant from a healthy person to a sick person and their health improves. So one type of bacteria... You can honor somebody's physiology, but there's another type of bacteria in your body. You could harm somebody's physiology. And with a small intestine bacterial overgrowth, the bad guys are trying to push their way into the domain of the good guys. And this will be noted when you have certain foods, especially fibers, and you take a probiotic and you get terrible bloating, terrible lower belly pain, like below the uh, belly button, and also pain in your right hip where the ileocecal valve is, where the, where the the bacteria are trying to work their way. They're trying to what's called translocate from the large intestine and invade the small intestine. So these are issues that many people, if they had them, they'd know. If they, if you suspect you have them, get them found out before you, you know, take a drug. Again, the side effects aren't that bad, but it has baggage. So before, well, I, but, but I think what you're saying is that uh, even though I mean all drugs have side effects, but if you're able to acknowledge what these side effects are and maybe mitigate. Uh, the development of these side effects by some of the things that you've been talking about, maybe that makes their drug experience that much better. better. All of a sudden, yeah. Now they could take this drug versus not take it and realize the gains from it. Yep. The body doesn't need help. It just needs no interference. And those tests that I just mentioned, this was the best I could come up with for that doctor and say, hey, these are things that could interfere with your dad having the best experience. And he checked out clear and we're at 40 pounds, uh, 30, 37 pounds as of this morning was the check-in call. So pretty cool. So side effects, uh, mild to moderate side effects occur in 80, 81 to 95% of people. So holy cow, everybody, everybody, everybody. The common ones, nausea and vomiting. We talked about that earlier. Material sitting in the digestive tract, specifically the stomach longer. Right. Well, 
your body doesn't like things sitting around. So nausea is that sensation of your body saying, this is sitting too long. It's putrefying. It's rotting. Get it out of me. So then the seal feelings of nausea all the way to fully expressed nausea, which is vomiting. Next, diarrhea, uh, constipation. So um, most people are going to get some mild to moderate. But again, most people don't really discontinue due to side effects. I mean, the discontinuation uh, stats on this were anywhere from 4.9% to 12%. That's pretty doggone good. Um, next, well, there's some other rare, less common side effects. Um, and those are going to be, um, let me think of them as we go. Like the severe side effects are going to be the bowels shutting down, um, nausea that gets overwhelming. Um, we'll talk about that nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and constipation that get very severe. So let's, let's, let's jump into those now. Um, the majority of side effects, which you should know occur after you increase the dosage. Why? Well, if a little bit of this drug slows down movement through the body, through the gut, um, as you increase the dose, movement slows down that much more. And so titrating the levels, that becomes tough. So you asked the question earlier about, well, how long does this stuff last in the system? I don't know. How good your liver clearance? How good your phase one, phase two detox? I think that's going to play a role. Um, and so why in titration, meaning how much a person uses is so individualized, the doctors, you know, uh, gradually, like you go to all the companies, you go to their website and they'll give titration schedules like uh, half a milligram and milliliter to 1.5 to, you know, how they, they just gradually increase it. But at every increase, you've got to watch the side effects and the side effects usually come at dose increase. So again, let's the nausea. The nausea is due to gastric emptying. So your body also with this, you can't hold the same volume of food, nor can you hold the same volume of water. And so most people who are taking this medication need to make sure they're getting smaller meals more frequently, almost like somebody who's doing a gastric sleeve or a gastric bypass, right. but you've also got to get water more more frequently. Um, the patient that I'm talking about, uh, his his child who's a doctor was like, hey, dad's getting all these weird headaches. I said, well, what's his urine look like? Well, he was getting dehydrated and he, and he just wasn't yeah. thirsty because the same parts of the brain, I believe the thalamus, there's a the thirst and hunger mechanisms are right next to each other. You shut off hunger, you're going to shut off thirst. So um, the vomiting, if somebody's dealing with vomiting, um, then there's some really good new herbal strategies like uh, ginger tea, like a really concentrated ginger tea. Go to Whole Foods and grab ginger tea. It's like double the dose, like two tea bags and six ounces of water, not like one tea bag and eight ounces or 10 ounces of water. Then there's something called deglycerized licorice, DGL. That works really, really beautifully on, on people with gut issues. What is, it, what, what is that again, Phil? DGL, deglycerized licorice. Okay. And we use it. We use it for folks with with gut issues all the time, and it's it, it it's wonderful. I encourage everybody to look into it. Is it just an anti diabetic? Is that the primary of that? It's oh boy, deglycerized licorice is going to help with. It's a mucosogen. Okay. So it's going to increase the protective mucus barrier. So uh, your, your digestive tract is a barrier system and DGL helps to heal repair it. It's also a mucosogen. Um, so if things are sitting longer, um, and they, they're sitting on delicate, fragile digestive tissue, um, if we can put a healthy coating of wax, so to speak right. on that delicate digestive tissue, you're going to have less irritation. All right. Um, so let me, let me ask you, uh, cause you, you, you brought up another point <laughs> about, uh, you know, the, the effect on the gastroparesis and, and uh, what about patients who have a lot of dysautonomia? For example, your, your, your diabetic population, great example, is they're going to have some dysautonomia and that's undoubtedly going to affect the, uh, the normal peristalsis of the gut. They already have gut issues. Yep. You have to be a little bit more careful with that when you put them on this drug because yep. of that. So, so, if, if somebody is dealing with constipation, uh, if they're dealing with a vagus nerve breakdown, so the vagus nerve is what controls peristalsis, dysautonomia, 
falls into that category. So it basically for, for the layperson, it's less movement, less neurological signals to move the train along from hooter to tutor, as we keep joking about. Right. But when you decrease peristalsis, um, it will become far worse, far worse with semaglutides. And so uh, for that person, um, artichoke, ginger root, aloe is a good one. Like aloe, we use something with patients called cape aloe. Cape aloe is good for acute bouts of constipation, um, not to be used on a regular basis, but but it's really, really a, an important thing. I, I, I would have like with this patient of mine who was trying to help her dad out, uh, we had them looking at the Bristol stool chart and like going through all the phases of something called the Bristol stool chart to get an actual idea. Like we talked to her dad and hey, yeah, how, how do you do when you go to the bathroom? Oh, it's normal. Uncomfortable conversation. Right. And we pulled out the chart and made him show us. And what was normal to him was not okay. It was actually more constipated. So we were able to kind of see, hey, we might have some side effects coming our way. What do we need to do to head those things off? Um, so yeah, uh, with, uh, anytime there's a, there's already tendency towards things not moving well through the gut and you slow it down. Um, you gotta be careful. The most rare one is going to be bowel obstruction, which I mean, that requires surgery. That's going to be a rare, rare instance, but that's kind of like the air we're in that kind of air right now. We're talking about kind of very severe consequences. Um, but diarrhea, uh, that's a big one. So everybody thinks about what about the person that doesn't have good movement? What about the person that has diarrhea, the person that moves too much? Well, we'll get people who take this and they'll get something called osmotic diarrhea and okay. they'll get something called overflow diarrhea. Um, so you got to be careful if you're constipated. Um, you'll get these what are called dry pockets um, of fecal matter. And the body sort of liquefies the, the other fecal matter to actually get around it. Um, so that will be called overflow diarrhea when, when, when something's blocking the road, so to speak. And right. so the shoulders of the road get, get taken. So material can flow around. Um, again, that's when you start seeing the, the, the risk of a bowel obstruction. That's going to usually appear in somebody that's constipated and then they take this drug and now all of a sudden they get diarrhea. That's a big one. Watch out for that. I've had a history of constipation. I go once every three days, which isn't okay. And now all of a sudden I get diarrhea. Oh boy. Oh boy. I'm thinking overflow diarrhea. I'm thinking, make sure, get them checked out just to make sure we don't have an obstruction forming. And then we talk about osmotic diarrhea. So that means when you slow down the amount of food moving through, the body says this undigested or unneeded material, these toxins, these chemicals, these critters that are in the gut, bacteria and so on. The body says, well, I'm kind of used to them moving through at a normal pace. It's going way too slow. So the body will irrigate, irrigate the bowels, flood water in there to do what? To wash it all away. Um, and so with osmotic uh, diarrhea or uh, with overflow diarrhea, you want to think electrolytes that have no sugar added. You want to think taking broth. You want to think coconut water, um, fiber, and then try to figure out what, what kind of diarrhea and normalize it. Um, there's a lot to get into there because we can get into the microbiome and something called dysbiosis, but kind of an important piece of the puzzle when we're looking at side effects. Um, so when we kind of, as we go through this, um, some other rare vicious side effects, hypoglycemia, kind of rare, um, hypoglycemia with people doing semaglutide, uh, just cause of the mechanism, it was just very rare. Um, the next most common rare side effect would be pancreatitis. And so, um, for people with a history of pancreatic issues, um, could be a problem here. People with gallbladder issues, people with a sluggish gallbladder, gallstones, history of blockages. That's semaglutides are a 28% increase in gallstones. Um, and for those people using cholagogues, cholagogues, uh, for those people that don't know, that's, that would be a, for the, the natural folks, that's the natural, it's the herbalist, it's the botanical people's term. A cholagog is something that helps to clear out, purge, the gallbladder. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah. Purge the gallbladder to get some, to get some 
material released. So whether it's sludge or actual stones themselves, cologogs are really effective. Um, then with the gallbladder also, you want to look at, uh, remember from, from school, the four Fs, female, fertile, the pejorative fat and 40. Um, so yeah, 40, you want to think gallbladder, uh, female, um, yeah, more t tendency towards it. When they talk about fertile, I think what they really meant, meant here when it comes to semaglutides and gallbladder problems with fertile, we're thinking more hormonal issues. Um, so this is a woman who's perimenopausal. This is a woman who's on birth control. This is a woman who's taking estrogen for any reason. And it's also a dude whose testosterone is aromatizing and converting to estrogen. You've got to watch out for these things. And then the last one, um, kind of one of the very uncommon but vicious uh, side effects would be acute kidney injury. Really rare. Um, but when you do semaglutide, the decreased thirst and the GI side effects, like if you get diarrhea or vomiting, well, you're going to become dehydrated and uh, got to watch for kidney injury. Not very common. The most the most common people that happens to are the elderly in polypharmacy, those folks that are just on you know, handfuls of meds and again, so, you've got issues. Well, yeah. Well, you mentioned something that I was just thinking about and that's polypharmacy. So if we're slowing down the gut mobility, motility, however you want to term it, uh, yeah. how does that affect the bioavailability of some of the other agents that, that patients may be taking? Because they may be taking a drug just fine and it's doing great. And all of a sudden they start on the uh, semaglutide and now they're, they're all, not only is the microbiome change, but the whole absorption milieu is affected and they may not have the bioavailability of the drug like they had before. Is there any, any, any data out there that says, man, you really should watch it if they're on this, might have to up the dosage or? Yeah, that's why you better be in contact with your prescriber. So some people get all ticked off at their doctor. Um, a fella who I love, a friend down the street from me, um, he, he's been a patient and he is doing the injectables and he's, he's mad. He's kind of hacked off. My doctor makes me come in every week for the injection. You know, that pen, they could just give it to me. I could take it home. Well, yeah, they could, yeah, they could, but, but they need to monitor you for rate of absorption. Are you developing any problems? And again, blood's going to be the best way, but there's going to be symptomatic, uh, clues. So for instance, one of the things we'll talk about in a second. When, when you're taking these meds and you slow down digestion, therefore you slow down absorption. When right. you slow down digestion and absorption, then you're going to be missing out on micronutrients, your vitamins, your minerals. Um, you're going to be missing out on nutrients that, uh, that fire up something in your body called the mitochondria. Well, darn sure you're going to be slowing down absorption of, uh, of, of any, any chemicals that are being onboarded. And so can the and the drugs you're taking orally, are, are, are they fabricated in such a way that your body can, that they'll just eventually work their way in? Maybe. Or maybe they'll be sort of slowed down and held out of the body. We don't know. We also know that, that the liver, when you slow down digestion, liver's part of the gastrointestinal tract. Right. So anything that messes with digestion is going to mess with the liver. Well, the liver is what's going to be processing those drugs. And then clearly, if you mess with digestion absorption, you just mentioned the microbiome, the little critters that live inside of you, you throw them off. Like the, the microbiome affects brain chemistry, hormones, how you detox, uh, musculoskeletal function, inflammation in the bloodstream, uh, your mood, your memory, uh, blood sugar balance, energy production. I mean, the list is, it's insane. The thyroid hormones. I mean, it's, it's a long right. list. So again, the people that look at this, and they say, hey, the, the people that come to me, if they're if they're in danger, then this drug, the baggage is worth the, the juice is worth the squeeze. The baggage is worth is worth the, the the benefits. In the same time, I get people who are very naturally minded who say to me, okay, I, I, I'm gonna use it. I'm gonna use this medication for a time, but I want to plan for when I come off it, or I want to plan for if I plateau, or I want to try to avoid this altogether and see if I can get my body to function a little bit better and work on it for me. And that kind of leads us to uh, the next slide. What improves, right? So we had the, the side effects. What improves long-term weight loss? Well, let's let's hit it here. Some shocking facts about this is when people take this med, um, most regain 
weight 50% of what they lost in about two years. Uh, and the rest of the studies, um, within five years, most people have regained about 80%. And here's the deal. It's not for lack of trying. Dr. B, this ain't for lack of trying. Yeah. The research that came up with this, the average woman goes on approximately 130 diets in her lifetime. 130 diets. Wow. 130. Okay. That's the average number. Because I was looking at what 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 makes this fail, and that data came up. So, um, motivation that's usually not the problem. So why won't it stick? It won't stick because of physiology. The results don't stick because of physiology. So let's look at this thing. It's called the gap effect, or the energy gap effect. So your body metabolically adapts to things. You go out in the sun, you get a tan. Metabolic adaptation. I go work out with my meathead friends and you get stronger. That's an adaptation. I'm harming my body or I'm putting stress on my body to elicit an effect. Well, losing weight, it has an adaptation to it. And this thing called the energy gap is the biggest reason people struggle. So when you lose weight, your appetite slows down and you, and, or excuse me, your metabolism slows down, your appetite increases. So why? You get signals to the brain, this thing we talked about called the hypothalamus, and these signals are that you're being deprived of energy. And so when the brain says you're being deprived of energy or that you're losing body fat, a hormone called ghrelin all of a sudden pops up. So ghrelin is your primary hunger hormone. When you're feeling not yourself, the Snickers commercial, and you're right. getting hangry and you're just dying, that's ghrelin. Your ghrelin levels are high. Now, this is part of the cruel joke of the energy gap. Ghrelin goes up, so your body is telling you, feed me. I'm dying. Feed me. While that's happening, your basal metabolic rate, your metabolism slows down. So you're getting increased call to bring more up, and then your body's ability to burn off slows down. That's a cruel joke. And so you begin to have a loss of your normal metabolic rate. Now, it makes sense because you're losing body mass. You're losing cells that normally were expending energy. So there's less of you now. So there's less energy demands. But this is further exacerbated by the brain, by this energy gap. It's the brain saying, I want to keep Stephen Barrett alive if there's a famine. I want to keep Phil alive if there's a famine. So let me make him hungry. If I've lost any weight at all, I'm going to make Phil hungry. I'm going to make him feel kind of crappy. I'm going to slow down his me metabolism. So here's the actual numbers. We we alluded to this earlier. For every 2.2 pounds lost, your basal metabolism drops by about 30 calories a day. And your, okay. appetite, and your appetite increases by 100 calories a day. So that means you've got a 70 to 80 calorie gap. So over the years, well, 70 to 80 calories extra a day that my body wants to get in, not a big deal. But in 10 days, that's almost a pound of fat. So multiply that over years, then you got that, that, that adipose tissue coming back. And again, adipose tissue is a reservoir. The body wants to keep it. And it wants to reacquire it if it loses it. So here becomes the sweet spot. This is what was really cool with the research. You've got to get past a year. If you can get the weight off and keep it off past a year, then the brain resets itself and says, okay, I'm a new Phil. I'm a new Steve. And I'm okay with being a little lighter. And it stops the, the crazy, make you crave more, slow down your metabolism. And so uh, we go to the next slide. So well, what well, before, before you go back to... Can you go back to that slide? If we just yeah, add? sure. Okay. So are you telling me that these stats where it says in two years, if they, they stop the drug 50%, they'll gain back 80% after five years, but that doesn't apply if you can keep them off for one year? And now a message from our sponsor. Well, folks, if you're over 40 and you're not using a supplement to augment nitric oxide production, you should really rethink that. This molecule is absolutely imperative to health, not to mention the cardio protection. Nitric oxide is a physiological molecule that does so many things for your health. I never miss a day of nitric oxide supplementation. That's how important it is. Long overdue, there is now a nitric oxide replenishment formula without the fear of oxalates. Approved Medical Solutions does not use beets, spinach, or arginine. Approved Medical Solutions is proud to offer our audience their oxalate-free nitric oxide formula. If you are not a healthcare provider, you can still get started 
by going to ApprovedMedicalSolutions.com and use the code SBARRETT at checkout and you will receive a 10% medical discount savings. For licensed practitioners, just go to ApprovedMedicalSolutions.com and register. They have unique bundles for all of the full-fledged spelunkers of the Pod of Inquiry. Use Pod of Inquiry at checkout after registration, and I am certain you will be pleased not only for yourself, but for all of your patients. Here's a little secret. If you order their testing strips and test every patient for a few clinic days, you will see that nearly every one of them will be deficient. When they see this result, they will want you to start them on it immediately. Now, thanks to Approved Medical Solutions, you can give them the best care without the worry of oxalates. Thanks for watching. You can start today. Yes, if you can get past that one year mark and yeah. keep up, keep keep the momentum up, so to speak, then what I what I saw is that your likelihood of avoiding that fifty percent gain after two years and that eighty percent regain after five years, you're you're going to do pretty good. And more than that is the rebound. That's what we really want to watch out for. Because again, that stat to me was kind of impressive. So for every twenty to thirty, uh, for every two pounds lost, your your body's demand for calories, your your metabolism, what you burn drops about 20 to 30 calories a day, but your appetite increases about three times that, maybe you know, three, three to five times that. So it's kind of a cruel joke. It's your body saying, I want that fat. Get right. Give me, give, me, give me that protection. Give me that storage. I need that. So any drop, you're fighting a double battle. Number one, it was to get the weight off. And number two, once you get the weight off, your body then has mechanisms to protect you to try to put it back on. And with that number, to rebound, meaning not only do you put the weight back on, but it's usually that weight and then some, and it's frustrating. So we want to get into what are the strategies? So, so the thing, yeah. let me interrupt you one, one more time. Please, because please. I think it's so important here. That's a really important thing that you just said. And I, I think that almost any practitioner that is going to prescribe this to their patients should educate the patient about you need to if you're going to be serious about this, you got to take this for one year. And this is the reason why. All right. So I think that's a really important nugget that, that the audience is going to get out of this. But then but we haven't talked about loss of muscle mass in this. And that is an important thing because, you know, muscle equals longevity. We know that. Yeah. Uh, so tell me about that a little bit as well. Well, anytime you're losing weight, your body is going to lose fat, but you're also going to lose muscle. Um, and it makes sense. If you're eating less, then you're going to be getting less amino acids, right? Protein, yeah. the amino acids, the building blocks. Your body can't perform its daily cell functions without enough amino acids. And so the body then goes to get, goes to reserves. So for, to, to keep you living, the body goes to fat for its reserves, but to build you, to keep you running, to repair, repair organs while you're sleeping or throughout the day. The reserves for energy are fat, but what are the reserves for repairing your heart? What are the reserves for rebuilding your liver every day? What are the reserves for healing and working on keeping the kidney up to par? Amino acids. Well, tell me where those reserves live. Not in fat. They live in muscle. So when you take these meds, decrease movement of food through the body. So decrease, in in decrease intake of food. What's that mean then? Body begins to eat into reserves, both fat and muscle. That's totally ignored. So you'll see people who are like, gosh, I'm, I'm not making gains in the gym and my arms and legs are getting smaller. That's cool. But the one thing I'm really worried about is your heart. Right. That's the big one because the, the most important muscle of all is the heart. So you've got to make sure you're getting enough protein um, so you don't stress the heart and lose muscle mass, which is going to, right? It's there, There's no sense like I'd rather be heavier and muscular with less body fat than be skinny fat. I lost, I lost, uh, you know, my dad, God love him. He's, he's an awesome dude. And he's in his eighties and he's dealing with a heart condition that he was born with and they knew it would come to visit him. And so part of managing his heart is they want to keep his weight down. Well, again, my dad's a big dude. And so I've known him most of my life in the, in the three hundreds. My dad did some stuff that's pretty amazing. If you knew him, it'd blow your mind in any event. He's now bragging me every day. I'm three, 300. Now I'm 280. Now I'm 270. Now I'm 260. Now I'm 250. Hey, dad, that's not normal. That's right. not normal in three months. That's not normal in six months. And I look at him and I say, wait a second, your belly, your, 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 your waist is roughly the same size, a little smaller, 
But look at your chest, your big arms, your humongous calves. My dad had calves that are like 24 inches around. That's it's it's shocking. He was enormous. And at 85, he still has really big muscles, but he's losing muscle mass. And the doctors for his heart are saying, we're just happy he's losing weight, takes pressure off the heart. And I'm looking at that saying what you said, which is loss of muscle means loss of longevity. I want this guy around for 120 years. That's a scary thing. Well, if we go back to this slide here, so if they gain 50% of the weight that they lost in two years, that is that may be fifty percent of the weight, but that doesn't mean that they're getting that muscle mass back. It's you're gonna gain fat back. Yeah, you ain't gonna uh, gain the muscle back. Yeah, that's my point. You know, so again, that goes to the nugget about well, if you're gonna take this thing, you better take it for a, a year so that we don't get this weight gain because the weight gain that you get after you stop is all fat, no muscle, but the weight loss was fat and muscle, so it's a conundrum. You're behind. Yeah, you're behind. So yeah, you've taken stress off the system, but not in a good way. It's it's not it's not as beneficial as it could have been. So this becomes the key. Do we take for length of time, duration of time? Maybe. But what about the doctors once a patient hits the weight goal or once they hit uh, a blood sugar goal? They're gonna pull them off anyway. So you better have a strategy. So whether you stay on for a prescribed amount of time, maybe good idea, maybe not, or whether you stay on until you hit a certain goal, but I would say you need to have a commitment of a year, uh, you know, from the time you start this, even past the time you stop to make sure you've got something in place to manage your physiology, to, to, to make sure that you can back up the weight you've already lost with proven weight loss strategy. So this is kind of the really cool, like note it, jot it down portion of the episode, because we're going to go into proven weight loss strategies that, that, that can make a huge difference. So can we ask you do it? All right. Yeah, so it. what improves long, long-term weight loss success? Diet change are necessary. So when we look at diet change, if you follow any diet, you're going to have results. Most people don't follow any. Low-carb diets, as you might think, have a slight, slight statistical advantage. High-protein diets, well, they make you feel fuller. They increase your overall energy expenditure, so they tend to work better, and we like them, Dr. Barrett and I do, simply because we protect that muscle. So uh, exercise is important. Why? Because you burn calories, but also we want to keep your muscle mass on. So again, to to keep your body holding muscle mass, you got to use it to, or, or lose it. Well, if you're taking this medication, you're really going to be losing a lot, both fat, but also the potential of muscle. So stimulating muscle is going to be pretty doggone important to make sure that that we're not you know dropping too much. Um, we go back to proven weight loss. I wanted to hit something. So before you even do these changes it would be wise to correct the contributors to obesity. And so we talked earlier about what contributes to obesity. Well, depression, get that under control. If you have an eating disorder, this is really not a good good thing. You got to get that under control. What if it's a thyroid issue we talked about? What if you have that Cushing's disease or you have a drug side effect? You've got to get that figured out and under control before you do this. Then the diet changes make sense. So we talked about the low-carb diet. I like keto. Um, keto is great. Uh, it, it, it's safe, by the way, did the research on it. A ketogenic diet is safe for people who are diabetic and want to take semaglutides. Um, the problem with keto is it's usually not sustainable. Wow. Um, some people, you hear those success stories of people stay on it for, for forever. Most people, it's not, it's not sustainable. But again, for type 2 diabetics with semaglutide, uh, keto worked best. Um, probably for the general population, um, a healthy and balanced Mediterranean diet that omits grains, that'd be a really sharp diet. Matter of fact, put this, stamp it in the notes. If, if people want that, I created one for my patients, about a nine page, beautiful. It was created for us. It's got beautiful graphics, a really wonderful, healthy, balanced keto diet or a Mediterranean diet. I'll be happy to yeah. share. We, we can, we can send it out to the folks. It's beautiful. Again, um, protein, want to make sure you're getting that. Do we go into... Do you have a recommendation for protein consumption for people? Do you go with, you know, one gram, one gram per kilogram of lean body mass? Do you do uh, one gram of protein per pound of lean body mass? Do you have a formula that you like to follow for protein? Oh, myself? No, because I don't, I mean, that's the, you know, that's the area where, you know, I would put it back to the functional medicine guys like you, but yeah, I think generally speaking, what is it in the, I mean, most of the stuff you read, it's a, a gram to a gram and a half per 
per kilogram per day? Yeah, yeah. So a lot of people do, you know, the meathead at the gym says, oh, it's two grams per pound of body weight. That's a bad idea. The research originally was in kilograms, not in not in pounds. So if you were to convert your body weight to kilo, kilograms, it's 1.2 to 1.6 grams per kilogram. Um, a simpler rule of thumb might be take your body weight in pounds. Um, one one formula I heard is body weight in pounds, then uh, we'll multiply that, lean, get your lean mass, and then one one gram per pound of lean mass. That's a that's a pretty good formula. Um, yeah. So let me let me keep going here. Uh, it, exercise initiate ex- exercise plan. So you want to burn calories. So when you're burning calories, you're exercising, you're depleting your glycogen, right? So your stored sugar. And that's what then causes the mitochondria of your cells in order to keep making energy, energy, they have to go through fatty acid, oxi- fatty acid oxidation. So we exercise, we burn some calories, we're taking semaglutides, we're managing a really great diet, but this exercise says, I got to get fuel from somewhere. So what does it do? It goes and gets fuel from body fat, which is super cool. But here comes another issue. I'm taking you for a walk. I've got to get my, my computer charger here. So you're, you're walking through the palatial estate. That's my humble hobby. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I got to get my charger. So computer's dying. So here's the inside scoop. So in any event, um, when we are doing semaglutides and we slow down absorption of nutrition, what's one of the big concerns? Well, if you don't get your micronutrients we talked about before, remember those? So right. your vitamins and minerals. Well, it's these micronutrients that keep they keep your mitochondria working and the mitochondria are what produces energy. And this is now as my children are getting home from school and there's going to be noise coming in. So get ready for that. In any event, um, we want to consider, uh, if you're exercising and you're doing semaglutides, probably making sure you're on a really healthy vitamin mineral with our patients, we use something from our store called mitonutrient caps. And there's my oldest daughter. That's the one you helped right there. And a gale. <laughs> Anagel, come say hi. Hey, Anagel, congratulations, by the way, on uh, getting your acceptance to UGA. We're proud. Yeah. We're very grateful. Sure. Thank you. Thank very you. Nice. All right, love you. Get out of here. She's in a play tonight. That, that was the flowers behind me earlier in that scene. Okay. Those flowers, the girls are in a play in Cinderella. And so, uh, yeah, we, we're not we're not that aristocratic that we have uh, fresh cut flowers laying around the house all the time. It's because they were performing last night. So. In any event, we'll make sure patients that that decide to go on this are taking um, a, a, a chelated uh, micronutrient blend uh, in our in our clinic. It's called mitonutrient capsules. Chelated, it's bound with an amino acid, so all the nutrients in there can get into the bloodstream really quick, whether or not digestion is slowed or impaired in any way. Mm-hmm. So, because we need to keep. Right. Yeah, so right. if you if your mitochondria aren't working properly, your weight loss is is going to happen, but it's going to be slow. If you keep those suckers fired up, holy cow, you'll 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 maximize what you're doing with this medication. And that's that's a that's a beneficial tool. Um next, uh again, lifting weights, greater muscle volume right there, increases metabolism. Um, and again, it minimizes lean muscle mass, which was your point. With some aglutide, you're gonna lose common side effect, lose a muscle mass. But exercise wise, how much should you get? I keep getting shocked and awed every few months. Um, the lead cardiologist with the Mayo Clinic put out a research study. I think it was University of Missouri. He did it with, but new parameters for exercise. And I was shocked and saddened because I hate doing cardio. I don't like going for walks. I definitely don't like jogging at the weight that God put me under. I'm not made for lots of wind sprints. So I would do my exercise as all weightlifting. My cardio was weightlifting. My muscle stimulation was weightlifting. We found out the, be- the positive beneficial effects of weightlifting die at about 60 minutes a week. Ooh, okay. Steve, I was getting, I was getting six to eight hours a week of weightlifting. Yeah. A lot to directly reduce. And that's really, that's a hard concept for people who are in the biohacking world because that feeds a lot of endorphins to them. But it's a it's a feel good thing, but uh, it's hard to get people to understand you need a day of recovery uh, as much as you need the the exercise as well, and that 
you know. Yeah. So, well, because they, they think they're getting recovery because today was chest day and tomorrow will be leg day and then I have back day, then I have arm day, then I have lateral oblique day, then I have... The problem is your hypothalamus and your pituitary gland that are generating your hormone production and your growth hormone, they don't get a day off. Right. That's where it came from. But I was really shocked to see the research that said that the benefits diminish after 60 minutes to the point that it's that it would be better had you not lifted at all. Wow. Holy cow. Yeah. That was shocking. I'm still having a hard time wrapping my head around that, but <laughs> maximum longevity benefits on weight training or put it right around 24%. Now, uh, so again, if you're going to live to 100 years old genetically, you'll you'll get that full uh, you'll you'll get that full 100 years if you if you get your weight training every week. If you don't do it properly or do too much or don't do enough, then you lose 24 years. You you might get to 76. Now, when we talk about big, cardio, it, to me it is, yeah, yeah it's a very big deal. But but it shocks me because you would think you would think that well, better to overdo than underdo. Well, this is one of those situations where. We're overdoing is terribly, terribly uh, rough. Again, still having a hard time wrapping my head around that research. I don't like it. I don't want to believe it, but it's what it is. I'm actually, as soon as that research came out it, or got into my, as soon as I, as I heard it, I immediately did a blood test, saw that my um, thyroid was slowing down a little bit. It, it, there's no problem with it. It just wasn't optimal. So I said, all right, we're going to do a little experiment here. And I switched my weight training and I have three more weeks and I'll be at two months of doing um, a large amount of cardio and no more than one hour of resistance training a week. And I'm going to check my blood and see what the thyroid's doing, see what the brain communicating with the thyroid's doing, see what my hormones look like. And I'm hoping to see that a benefit. I'm feeling a lot better. That no, that's great. Yeah, that's a great study. I mean, even though it's a nan of one, it's very valuable because you don't feel loud. You then progress on and and monitor yourself in that standpoint. Yeah. Well, when I wake up every morning, you know, you hit the ground and sometimes like the old injuries, the knee, the hip and the ankles that are sore, yeah. they feel like you're standing on glass and you got to take like 30 steps till you start to feel like a human being again. That's all gone now. So there's got to be something good happening here related to inflammation. And again, chronic, chronic overtraining, you're going to be chronically inflamed. Let's see what it does to my, to my, uh, endocrine system. And then I'll give you, I'll give you more feedback. Um, when we talk about cardio, for every thousand or so, every one to two thousand steps walked, there's a ten percent increase in longevity. Um, you know, twelve thousand is the max benefit they measured. But we're seeing research now when I'm when I'm looking up data for patients on how much how, how much walking they need to get a day. It's like ten thousand steps a day is the is the recommended. Right. That that's kind of aggressive. It's five miles. We need it, but again, our lifestyles don't allow it. I know I don't get that. And then, so as much, basically as much low intensity as possible, then we get into the realm of the moderate to high intensity. And so for me, this comes in the form of getting on my recumbent exercise bike and doing sprint intervals, 30 seconds of high intensity with a minute and with 90 seconds of, of lower intensity. And I'll maintain when I do that within five minutes of starting that exercise, I'll maintain 85% or higher of my max heart rate which is really good. I do it for 20 minutes. So on a good day, I'll do morning and evening on a great day. I'll do morning, midday and evening again. So I'm getting 20, 40 on average minutes a day of, of 85% of my max heart rate. So that's high, that's high intensity. Um, great for the brain, great for hormones, great for nit nitric oxide synthase in the bloodstream, right. another podcast time. Um, but, but I'm, uh, but I'm doing 20 to 40 on a great day, 60 minutes a day. The recommended on that, when you're in the active weight loss chasing zone with with uh, semaglutide, 150 to 250 minutes uh, a week of that to achieve weight loss, okay? So okay. 150 to 250 with like really kind of cranking it, really pushing yourself. Um, I'm at 160, 160 minutes for the week so far. It's Friday. I've got a lot to go to get to that. And so it, it ain't easy to actually do it and be and be honest and legit about it. Now get ready for this. To maintain your weight loss. So to achieve the weight loss, you need 150 to 250 minutes of that moderate to high intensity. Once you get the weight loss, it ain't smooth sailing. You have to now increase from 150 to 250. You gotta you gotta migrate up to 200, up to 300, from two to 300 minutes a week now to maintain the weight loss. Holy. Yeah, yeah that's something you better. 
Yeah, that's a big increase because you have to overcome the energy gap that we talked about. Big deal, man. Big deal. And that's a, that's a doggone. It's almost depressing. Yeah. But it's the facts. The next other factors, we look at um, ongoing interaction with healthcare groups. Why do you think Weight Watchers has worked for so long? It's the Alcoholics Anonymous meeting with people, support. It's the Alcoholics Anonymous for weight loss. Decreased screen time. Man, you know when you're screen time. And you, oh, I, yeah. I, I do. I become a zombie. And what happens? Well, I wake up in a pile of uh, processed snacks that I should have never touched. Right? right. So, so I know darn well screen time messes me up. Doing the frequent small meals uh, throughout the day, two to three hours. Make sure you get breakfast. Time-restricted eating. Now, this doesn't mean inter intermittent fasting. I love intermittent fasting for 25 to 30% of my patients. Um, but time-restricted feeding means um, getting at least an eight-hour, right, when you're sleeping, the 10-hour mm -hmm. stop time. Um, there was research done, Nobel Prize research on fasting mimicking diets that showed if you're in that 10 to 12 hours of not shoveling something into your body, uh, it gives the gut, it gives the immune system, it gives your body a rest. Um, you, you signal autophagy, body gets rid of weak, dead, dying, mutated, cancerous cells. Um, so time restricted feeding is a good tool. Then portion control meals, meal substitutes. So, um, you know, portion controlled. Um, when you're on this med, you're going to eat less. Just make sure that you're prioritizing things like protein. Um, also, we're finding with patients using those like fresh meal kits that you, they come in the mail, they're already prepped. That's been a help. Frozen meals kind of stink, but there's people that come to me and that's literally the best they can do. So, okay, we got to do what we, what we got to do. So, um, yeah, so that's what we got there. Uh, we'll get natural alternatives in a second. So let me, let me go into a couple really cool additional support pieces. So we hit the hit on this earlier. So I'm going to repeat one thing. So complete protein powder. Why? getting a protein shake, uh, they're filling, they're calorie controlled, uh, they act as a meal supplement that supports holding on to lean muscle and it supports uh, getting the fat off. Next one we talked about a little bit ago, micronutrient, uh, increase your micronutrients, vitamins and minerals. Why? Because we want the mitochondria and the cells of your body to keep firing so that we can keep the fat loss going, preserve muscle mass. Um, it's interesting that most people, I'm looking for a stat here, mitochondria, mitochondria, again, the energy producers of the cells are compromised, are proven in research to be compromised in most most everybody with chronic obesity. Mm. The mitochondria are compromised. Mm. So, yeah. so your your oven, your engine, what burns fat doesn't work as well. So number one's protein. Number two, get the nutrients, the vitamins and minerals that support the mitochondria. Now, number three is liver support. So Fatty liver and obesity, 80 to 90% of people who are obese are dealing with some form of fatty liver. What level of infiltration is going to be, you know, up to the individual? Next, hepatocytes, the cells of the liver that get rid of waste for you, along with doing about 500 other jobs. Hepatocytes cannot perform phase one and phase two detox pathways adequately. So for your body to take waste and send it to the toilet, you have two phases to go through. Um, when you're dealing with somebody who's overweight, obese, really, the liver's already struggling. You've put them on this bed. Why might it might not work? Why? The liver's not keeping up. Um, also, fat soluble environment toxins and accumulate in this in, in in adipose tissue. So we talked earlier. You got some weight on you. There's probably gonna be some toxins in it. As you start getting rid of that fat, those toxins now burden your bloodstream, burden your lymphatic system. So there's got to be something to get rid of it. Um, and so now we can go into the botanicals that are shown to make a difference. So um, using something called hibiscus, using uh, lemon verbena, using green coffee, they've been demonstrated um, to increase your own endogenous natural production of GLP-1 and they decrease ghrelin. So what do we got? We got a similar effect. It's not going to be as strong as the drug. So don't hear me now. Don't, it, ain't, it ain't as strong as the drug. But your own GLP-1, boy, I, I, I can't love a drug as much as I like what Phil's body makes. And you can't love a drug more than you like what Steve's body makes. And so if we can increase our own production naturally, endogenously, and at the same time, 
decrease ghrelin, ghrelin, the thing that makes us crave and, and hunger, mm-hmm. we're in good shape. So the lemon verbena, hibiscus, coffee bean ex- extract do a heck of a job. And who wants that? This is the person who can't do semaglutide. This is the person who is stopping semaglutide. Um, or it's the person, right, who's just, look, I just want a natural approach. I want to see if I can do something. I, I like to think of it differently. So yeah, there's the person who doesn't want to ever get on it. That's fine. But we'll use this with doctors will send us patients and we'll use this protocol with the verbena, the hibiscus and the coffee bean. We'll use it for people on semaglutides, but they're having a plateau they can't break through. So people who want to skip it all together, people who are plateaued, but then we go people who are done with the semaglutides and they are trying to prevent the rebound, the weight gain. Mm-hmm. Or people who've succeeded, we'll use this for people who've succeeded and to help keep the weight off, to get past that year so they can comfortably look back and say, okay, I didn't put the weight back on. And there's what it does. The verbena, lemon verbena, stimulates metabolism, decreases fat production, stimulates fat, use for energy. It's anti-inflammatory, stimulates blood flow. Hibiscus gets the metabolism cranking, stops your body or inhibits the body from absorbing fats and carbs when you're eating. Kind of cool. Stimulates the body to burn fat for energy. It slows down inflammation, fights inflammation. Really neat effects with lowering blood pressure. Hold on. Come on, slide. Nice effects with lowering blood pressure. Um, The research on this was systolic numbers after six or eight weeks came down 22 22 points. Pretty cool with doggone hibiscus. And then green coffee bean stimulates metabolism, inhibits some absorption, stabilizes blood sugar, anti-inflammatory. And so like in our clinic, we had a, we had a product, we call it crave control through our, through our, uh, uh, companies that produce our nutrients for us. And it's been a pretty doggone neat thing to do. I'm just shocked when I take it, this combination of material, I'll take one at lunch, one at dinner. If I'm really craving things, I'll take two at dinner and it just shuts off those wild cravings provided I've eaten properly during the day. Right. And so far, this experiment for me, I've, I've done it for about six weeks. Right now, down about, this is for me, doing my exercise and using this uh, with a ketogenic diet. We're at about 30 pounds lost. And so, um, you know, I got about 30 more till I'm lean and mean, but that's pretty yeah, good for but, that. But, but go filled with... But Phil, with these natural uh, alternatives to sound blue diet, you have to look at the side effect profile. You're not getting nauseous and, and having a lot of GI distra- distraught. Yep. Uh, right. Right now. Correct? Not at all. Okay. So not at all. so maybe, you know, maybe there's someone hey, out there that says, you know, I would really like to look at this summer blue diet, but maybe I just try one of these more natural alter- alternatives first. That yeah. would be, or it's certainly going to be less expensive, I would think. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And there might well, be insurance uh, issues that say that that's not the case. But generally speaking, usually natural supplementation is always has a lower profile of adverse events and has, uh, it, it's a, it's less expensive than yeah. fight pathology. Uh, the cost is wild. Yeah. We've seen, you know, <clears throat> actually saw a sign on the side of the road. Looking for some glutides, only three hundred ninety nine dollars a month. Like, holy cow! That's a lot. Like, yeah. remember when we were kids? That was like a car cost that much, and now you get that to lose, you know, weight. Right. Of, you got to stay on it for a long period of time, and you might lose fifteen pounds. Holy cow! So yeah, there's got to be the the baggage. We talked about side effects, but also some of the baggage is uh, the cost. Um, so well, yeah, gonna, well, can you? Can you provide me with that study, the, link? You, the reference that you uh, uh, had for the the uh, exercise benefit? Profile? Yes, yes. I would love that. I'll try to attach that to the um, to the show notes. And I've got to wrap up here a little bit, but I want to make sure before we go that they know how to get in touch with you and and uh, your clinic. Yeah. Uh, so I'll put that in the show notes. But can you can you tell everybody that before I? Yeah, um, f h i a d r s dot com. Uh, Functional Health Institute of Atlanta is our practice. F h i doctors. Um, let me check. <laughs> I don't. I, yeah, we're we're 
we're, we're loaded up. I don't ever, my staff handles all this. So I think that's our email. I know our, I know our phone number is 770-948-2525. I do know that. All right. There we go. Uh, yeah. And I'm also going to get you the data on the nutrients and the references for it. So like, the verbena, right. this is, I'll yeah. get you the data. I'm looking at them on my phone right now um, mm-hmm. with, let's see, no less than 15 citations, papers uh, showing the effectiveness of it. So it's pretty, it's pretty locked in. Again, the natural material, mm-hmm. it's never going to work as crazy and as wonderful and as like high powered as, as a drug. But again, the, uh, the baggage is, is worth it. So I just love and I appreciate the opportunity. I know I went way over time and you're going to have a heck of a time. No, actually, uh, actually, it's got to be very easy because this has been so valuable. I'm just going to break it into two parts because I think people are going to really resonate with this because if they're not taking it, I guarantee you they know someone who is taking it right now. You better believe it. Yes. So you that's, don't how, that's how uh, common this drug is right now. And I, I think there's a I think there's still a lot of misunderstanding in the general public about what it does and and how it works. And I think once they listen to this, um, these episodes, they'll they'll have a better grasp on it. So no, I'm very appreciative of your expertise and and I always love hanging out with you. You know, why we we say, Oh, I'm gonna come down to you for an adjustment or something and you know, oh yeah, it'll take like ten minutes, but then two hours later we're still, you know, BSing about all of this great stuff. And and that's why I, I like this to you know have a discussion with you, and uh, we'll have to we'll have to come back and talk more about uh, detoxification because I think that would be a, a also a very interesting episode as well. But I just want to thank you so much, not only for your expertise, but uh, for being part of our our extended family and helping patients. And uh, it's just been a pleasure um, anytime we got the ability to interact with you and your wife Bridget. And uh, thank you, uh, thank you. So it's been great. So, hey, so you, 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 so you, thank you. And you've changed our lives and, uh, I appreciate you and I love you. And there's a, not a damn thing you could do about that. So <laughs> that's what we got. But I look forward to, look forward to talking to you soon, my friend. And, and, uh, I wish the best for anybody who gets to watch this. I hope it makes a difference for them. Um, I hope that the humor and I hope that the, 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 the way of talking, I hope it resonates with folks and, and they can look past where, where, uh, maybe I'm a little bit rough around the edges or maybe I'm a little bit more common uh maybe there's some uh, fancy folks with different diction and different words but but uh the message is delivered with heart and a lot of love and i'm grateful to be part of it and, I, and i'm so appreciative of you and what you've been doing and what you continue to do for me and my family and the patience that we share together so thank you well, thank you phil this episode is sponsored by savant sellers providers of boutique tier one reds at a tier two price point Let's imagine you are spelunking in a cave out in Napa Valley and you come across some of the juice from Savant Cellars. You may just never want to come out until it's gone. Savant Cellars sources all of their fruit from the really big name boutique vineyards. That's right, where the elites get their fruit. If we put a vineyard designation on our bottles, we would be contractually forced to sell our wines at three to four times our current pricing. Yes, full disclosure, I am one of the three principals and I'm very proud of our wines. Savant Cellars is the genius of wine. Simply great wines, vintage after vintage, crafted in a Bordeaux style so you can lay them down for years or drink them now. They simply just get better. Use the code SPELUNK15 to get a 15% discount at SavantCellars.com. That is C-E-V-A-N-T Cellars.com. SPELUNK15. We hope you all enjoyed today's show and got some truly empowering knowledge out of it. You can always follow up on anything we talked about in the show notes, found at our website, potofinquiry.com. If this incredible and educational conversation has tickled just a little bit of your cortex, please leave us a review and spread the message to your friends and colleagues. Let's keep spelunking. This podcast is designed for informational purposes only. It does not constitute any medical or surgical consulting advice or imply a development of any physician-patient relationship. The opinions of guests who are featured on the show are not necessarily the opinions of Dr. Barrett or the production team. This podcast is owned solely by Barrett Medical and Surgical Media, LLC. While the show is highly oriented for physicians and healthcare providers, anyone interested in the improvement of human performance and understanding will find us a welcome goblet to sip from or guzzle.
However, no representation or warranties are made in any way whatsoever on this podcast for any products, techniques, or other things discussed. Invited guests are not vetted by the pod of inquiry for their qualifications and may have a direct or indirect financial interest in what they present and discuss on the show. The pod of inquiry disclaims any responsibility from anything taken from the show if used personally or professionally. It is a responsibility of the listener to perform their own due diligence prior to the implementation of any ideas, products, techniques, or anything talked about on the show.